So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, today we're going to go a bit old, old school. I'm going to go back to the basics. We're just going to do a, a very short introduction of one um, part in the scriptures. Um, and then I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay? Um, so... Um, I'll start with a question. Um, then don't misinterpret the question, but are all books in the Bible created equal? <laughs> well, first of all, we know all scripture is interpreted by God. It's written by the Holy Spirit. Yes. But do we have any preferences, so to speak, of why some books should be read before others or in light of others right um any example you can take from the liturgy like how many scriptures do we read in every liturgy anything from the old testament actually yes just a little bit we read part of the psalms right um, before every gospel, right? So there, there you have it just right then and there, is that the church is saying, no, the New Testament c gives is priority over the old, right? Because the old is revealed in the new, and the new is concealed in the old, as we say, as the fathers teach us, right? Um, and then is there any difference between what we do or what the priest does or what the people do during the first... How many readings do we have? So we have the Pauline epistle, the Catholic epistle, the Acts, and then the Gospel, right? With the Psalm, okay? <laughs> we have the Synaxarium. It's after the, but it's not necessarily from the Scripture. It's just from the history of the Church, right? So, um, okay, from those four, which one is the priority? The gospel, right? How do we know this? It's, yeah, it's, it's a simple question, sorry. But I'm just trying to say, well, even um, we stand for the gospel. We don't necessarily stand for the others unless Abuna is still uh, holding the, the censer, right? We have the candles lit, right? We have its special tunes that um, actually, the other uh, um, readings have their own tunes. But what I'm trying to say is the, cr the gospel is the crown of all of Scripture, not just the New Testament, as the fathers teach us. Right? Um, and um, so anyway, I was trying to think. When I was in grad school, um, I took a Bible class, and the professor asked a really uh, upsetting question for me. And he said, um, if you only had the opportunity to bring three or four books in the Bible, which ones would you bring? I'm like, what are you talking about? The Bible is one unit. You can't do that, right? <laughs> you can't like start pitting one book against another. Um, but anyway, um, we know for sure that this, the, the gospel is, like I said, the crown, right? Um, because... It's the life and teachings and words and, and um, uh, the, the life of Christ himself, right? Which is everything is pointing to or coming, shining from um, those events, okay? But in, in the gospel itself, if you had to select a certain passage that kind of sums it all up, there's no right or wrong answer for this. <laughs> Any answer? Yes. Very good. So one verse it's, uh, every, um, it has to do with the salvation and the love of God. Very good. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Anyone? If, if there was a, a place in one of the four Gospels that you would kind of say, this is like the summary of all teaching uh, of Christ. So, again, there's no right, but for me, I guess, 
Um, <clears throat> If you look at, uh, I was reading, I don't know how accurate this statement is, but one of uh, the Bible scholars was saying that um, based on the common commentators, um, even from the church fathers, on which parts of, of the gospel were the most, um, he, he wrote that the first is the transfiguration, which was a surprise to me. I didn't think that was true. Um, but then he said, secondly, was the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Um, and, or I consider this as a mountain of a sermon, right? So today we're just going to briefly um, go over this. <coughs> Excuse me. St. Augustine, he says that if a person will devoutly and calmly consider the sermon which our Lord Jesus Christ spoke on the mount, I think he would find in it, as measured by the highest norms of morality, the perfect pattern of Christian life. Okay? So if you want to say, what is the best description of the perfect Christian St. Augustine says, Sermon on the Mount, hands down, right? And I believe him, right? And he says, every formative um, precept of the human, of man, uh, of the human life is found in it, right? Um, and it's basically, others ca call it the constitution of the kingdom of the new covenant. Um, and if you look, so where do we find it? Easy, I'm going to ask easy questions today. <laughs> Matthew 5 and... Six and seven. Okay, thank you. Um, so these three chapters, um, I, I find, you know, a lot of times um, some confession fathers or spiritual guides will recommend if you have an issue, if you have a problem, if you're trying to learn to repent, if you're trying to grow, these are probably the, the first three chapters you can go to. Sometimes we read scripture to grow in knowledge. Some, oftentimes, or more, more importantly, we need to grow in the Spirit, right? And um, especially when we come to repent, or as St. Paul says, we need to see ourself as, as when we look into a mirror, right, in order to grow, right? Um, so oftentimes, reading Scripture helps us to provide that mirror so that we can ask God to make those changes in us, okay? Um, so... Um, those three chapters basically have um, three different parts to it. Primarily, um, chapter five can be broken into two groups. The first one, we pray um, every day in the sixth hour, which is the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, right? And we'll talk about that in a minute, right? Um, and then the second part is basically the application of the new covenant, okay? Um, and then chapter six talks more about um, the, the spiritual life, right? Um, or the law of Christ, which is like the prayer and the fasting and the giving. And we, we select a lot of um, uh, portions from that in the beginning of Lent, as you'll see. And then chapter 7 um, is more of the relational life, right? How we, we deal with our fellow brethren if we have the right teachings and we're growing in, in the faith and in the spirit. What, what does it look like in the world and how does the Christian deal with other people, right? Um, and that's actually where we find the golden rule, right, is, is found in that seventh, seventh chapter. So to summarize though, chapter five is more of uh, the, the relationship of the Christian with himself or herself. Cha chapter six is more the relationship of the Christian with God. And chapter seven is more of the relationship of the Christian with others, Christian and non-Christian. Okay, um, and so as you can see, it applies to so many aspects of our life. Um, and I was doing just a little e exercise the other day about, you know, how many different pointers or different subjects or topics are mentioned in these seven chapters. Uh, I'm sure I missed a few, but I counted at least forty. <laughs> um, so th that's a lot of topics. You know, some some chapters or sections of the Bible is just like one main topic. Like, for example, you know, Proverbs focuses on wisdom, or First Corinthians 13, love, right? But, but these three chapters is, is basically the whole gamut of, of life. <laughs> um, so many different aspects. And maybe if there's time, I can start describing um, what, what you'll find in there. Um, so, uh, by the way, if, if anyone wants to go deeper in, in this, like, and so the whole purpose is this, is just kind of to get your 
mind's thinking more of ha, ha, here's a place where I can go deeper into, into um, every verse and every phrase and every word, right? Um, and so um, I just give a general introduction, but how does it start? It says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, right? But if you um, rewind a little bit, so that's chapter 5, that's how chapter 5 starts. And, and by the way, um, a summary of this will be found in, can also be found in the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 6, and we'll talk about that at the end, okay? Because um, there's some differences here. Um, but um, chapter 4 of uh, the Gospel according to St. Matthew talks about the baptism of Christ, the temptation, right? His, the calling of his disciples, right? And then the healing of the mul so multitudes come to him and are healed, and then he gives this teaching. Right? Th that's why he says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. Okay? Um, this mountain, actually, we had the opportunity or the blessing to visit this um, mountain uh, this summer. Right? And um, it's basically the, how they think. There was an um, early, like in the 3rd and 4th century, they built a church here saying this is where the Lord um, gave a lot of his teachings and most likely the Sermon on the Mount as well. Um, so it was the northern shore of Galilee um, and uh, uh, it was on a hill, right? Um, but with a flat, we'll get to that in a minute, but like a, a flat plain on top of the hill, right? And so um, the Lord went to high places many times in Scripture. And this is an important aspect, like... Um, Anyone can recall any other places in, in the gospel where the Lord went up on a mountain? Transfiguration, very good, <laughs> very important, right? So God is giving his glory in a high place, right? What else? Ascension, right? The Mount of Olives, we also visited, is on a high place, right? Um, uh, and... Uh, even the angels said, you know, the Son of Man will come in like manner, re relating to the second coming. What else? He prayed in Gethsemane, in the garden, um, but it was close to the Mount of Olives. Um, but you're close. Uh, the temptation was very high, um, and like we had to take cable cars just to go up there. It was, it was super high. Um, and hot as well. Um, so it, it shows that when we ascend on, on a spiritual level, there's going to be trial and temptation and tribulation. And that goes without saying, right? One more important mountain. There's others, but like we probably missed the most important <laughs> out of all of them. Sorry? Yes, the, the, the Lord was... Uh, crucified, right, on, on the Mount of Golgotha, right? Um, because, uh, well, it, it's a long story, but the, we, we say, as St. Athanasius kind of says, that the cross is the gateway um, to, to heaven, and he sanctified the way between heaven and earth, right? So it had to be above the earth to show that, you know, he's above all, but also to show the way or to pave the way for us to ascend, okay? Um, so um, this shows that the high points that the Lord went to were intentional because we need to ascend above the worldly things. We need to lift our minds above the worldly things. We have to grow in the spirit. And sometimes the, even the physical circumstances helps to get away from, from our normal, um, the things where we, like you know, work and school and all of that. Okay, um, and so, um, like Saint Jerome says, the Lord went up the mountain that He might bring the crowds with Him to the higher things. Okay, um, actually, He He says probably the Sermon on the Mount was um, the the Mount Tabor, <laughs> but that, that's the first I've I've heard of that. I'm I'm not sure if the other fathers agree with that. Anyways, um, so. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is, like we said, a mountain of a sermon, okay? The Lord takes us up to the mountain step by step um, to, to raise our minds, but also to teach us how to raise our daily life to, to, to the heavenly things, okay? Um, so that's why St. Matthew starts by saying, and seeing the multitudes, he won up on a mountain, 
And then it says, when he was seated. Why does he talk about being seated? Like, for example, right now, you know, I'm standing and you're all seated, right? But it was vice versa. And actually, that was the typical custom back in the day that, that the teacher would sit and the disciples would stand, right, and ask questions. Um, there was a Saint Arsenios who, who was um, very knowledgeable. Uh, he was a monk, but he was called by the emperor, um, I forgot his name, um, Theodosius, um, to teach his kids, his, his two sons, Honorius and Arcadius, for about 11 years. And one day he, he just kind of walked in on them, and he saw that Saint Arsenius was standing and they were seated. He was like, no, 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 you can't do this. Even if you're, you're princes, but you're not going to learn anything this way, and you have to humble yourself, and you have to give respect to the teacher. So they all stood, they stood, and, and he made Saint Arsenius uh, sit. Um, so the fact that the Lord sat on the mountain shows his authority as the teacher. Okay? Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're fine with it, <laughs> but that's just you know how the church. I think the church also said you know we stand to pray and we sit to learn, right? In, primarily in the church, that's how how, how it, it it goes. Um, uh, so like, I, I don't mean anything to say like we have to change. No, no, I'm just saying that's why Saint Matthew said he had he he was seated. Right? The Lord sits on the throne. Actually, in the early church, they did this. Like St. John Chrysostom, I believe, he, he had, uh, so in the early church, the throne of the bishop, do you know where it was located? It's not where it is today, in the front by the deacons. It used to be in the back of the altar, right? Um, and, and, and he would sit and give the sermon there, and um, the people would hear the word of, of God from the altar. But, I mean, the, that, the, that kind of changed, uh, obviously. The church said, no, no, let's bring it out. But in some ancient churches, you'll find, uh, ancient cathedrals, you'll find this. Okay? Um, and that's why sometimes they put the seven steps in the back of the altar, because those are the seven steps of the clergy. And so the bishop or the patriarch would sit on the, the throne in the middle, and then all the other bishops and priests would sit on the other seven steps. Um, anyways, um, so um, this was the sitting, like we said, is the proper posture of the teaching in the early days. Okay, um, and do you remember what I said right before um, he he taught these multitudes? What did the scripture talk about right before that in Matthew four? I said a lot of things. I said, you know, um, the temptation, right, and 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 the baptism. That's chapter four, and then after that um, he healed the people and then right before that <laughs> he called his disciples right so um, so um, some fathers say that this message and uh, sorry not not necessarily fathers I would say commentators um, describe this as a message only for the disciples okay um, and then you ask me, what do you mean by disciple? And then I say, well, we'll get to that in a minute, right? Because it says, he, when, he would see, when he was seated, his disciples came to him, right? I don't know if this was just the 12. It could have been just the people who were there, not only um, uh, to be healed, but to learn, okay? Um, and so um, let's kind of fast forward to the very end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, just to see the book ends of the sermon, right? So at the end of the um, sermon, at the chapter 7, um, I'll just read a, a few verses. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man who has built his house on the rock. Right? The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And then, he says the opposite, you know, of those who don't build their uh, how, house or their spiritual house on his teachings, it, it fell, right? But then after he finished, it says, St. Matthew writes, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, right? So the response was 
oh my goodness, that was the best sermon in the world, <laughs> right? And I think we're still t saying that until today. And um, like, obviously, like here is the Logos, here is the Word of God, here is the perfect teacher, the one without sin, the, the one who is God and of God and light of light, um, giving us these teachings. Um, <clears throat> some people say that this is, could have been just a compilation of different teachings, and they were not all given at the same time, we're not sure, right? But at least St. Matthew puts them all together uh, for us. Um, and some other people say he gave these teachings more than once, which is pretty likely because St. Luke gives us a similar sermon with some differences. Um, and it's not as lengthy, of course. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the, the disciples came and he said, once we become a disciple, we have to learn from the Lord, right? And vice versa. Once we learn from him, we want to be a follower of, of, of the Lord, okay? So um, then St. Matthew says something unique. He says, then he opened his mouth and taught them. Well, why did he use this phrase? Anyone know? I know we're going into the depth, but like there's purpose for why the Holy Spirit moved St. Matthew to write these phrases. Um, so if you connect this with Hebrews, um, chapter 1, um, uh, St. Paul says, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So in the Old Testament, how did God speak to everyone? Usually it was through the prophet whether it's Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses himself, right? Um, the people even, remember when Moses um, went up on the mountain and came and his face was shining, you know, the people were afraid. They're like, we don't want to talk to God. You, you do it and you, you put a veil on your face and come to us and then like tell us the, 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 we, we can't handle this, right? Um, so the people were used to having a mediator, um, which was the prophet, right? Um, but St. Paul was saying, okay, that's how it was in the Old Testament, but he says in these last days, the New Testament is considered the last days or the end times, or, you know, um, he ha God has spoken to us by his son, right? So the opening of the Lord's mouth, like just the fact that he has a mouth now because he took flesh and he took a form, right? In order that he could be with us and sit with us and teach us, this is a great grace and blessing. Right? So that's why St. Matthew emphasizes that he opened his mouth and taught them instead of opening the mouth of a prophet to, to teach us indirectly. Okay? Um, like St. Augustine says, he opened the mouth of prophets, now he opened his own mouth. <laughs> right? uh, or St. John Chrysostom says, he first taught with actions, then um, now he's, he's taught with words. Okay? Um, so just going into <clears throat> the structure of the Beatitudes, um, as, as we know them, you know, blessed are those, you know, um, who more for this should be comforted, right, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Um, there's actually a different n numbering if, if you ask or you look at the fathers or the commentators, right? Um, St. Augustine kind of clumps them into a group of seven, and then he says, if you look at these seven, um, blessed are, right, um, for theirs is, right? you will find also attached to that the seven gifts of the Spirit, right? And then he said also, you could summarize the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6 um, into seven parts, and he connects these sevens, these three sevens, right? Um, but most people actually consider these Beatitudes as eight. Um, and if you visit the church, like I was saying, on the, um, of the Beatitudes, they built it in octagonal shape, to, and they put the, the eight main virtues of um, the Beatitudes up there. Um, and other people will say, well, it's not seven, it's not eight, but um, there's a ninth one, you know, the blessed uh, are, are, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, right? Um, and then, but there is no, um, let me get it, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, blessed are those persecuted, persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, that's the, that's the, 
eighth one. And then the ninth one is, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Right? But there is no reward because it's attached to the one before. So they say that's nine. And then, um, who was it? Uh, uh, I can't remember which father said, no, there are ten if you include um, the, uh, the rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And he was saying, there's, if you count them as ten, then that's the equivalent of the Ten Commandments. So he compared, the fathers compare the Old Testament to the New Covenant, um, the Mount Sinai to this Mount of the Beatitudes, the bringing of the law through Moses through the bringing of the new standard of life through Christ. Right, he's saying, um, and Christ said, you know, I did not come to abolish, but to what? To fulfill and to complete. So this, um, ten thou shalt not, don't do this, don't do that, was translated into blessed are you if you do this, right? Um, and so um, the five books of, of the law, um, one of the father's comments, well, if you look at the gospel according to St. Matthew, there's five different chapters um, or sections where um, Christ gives the teaching. Like here's one chapter 5 and then chapter 10 and then chapter 18 and then chapter 23 to 27. So, those, so the five books of the law are now renewed in the five teachings, um, main um, sermons of, of Christ. <clears throat> and then the Ten Commandments, actually there are about 613 commandments in the Old Testament, now is translated or simplified um, or focused on you know, these Beatitudes. And then if you remember the Gospel of today, um, the, the lawyer said, well, what's your reading of the law, right? Summarize it even further into what? Love, love right? Love of God and love of your neighbor, as Abuna was saying today, okay? Um, <clears throat> and even the location of Mount Sinai, like with the thunder and the lightning, right? If, if you go to this place, it's actually very peaceful and calm and tranquil compared to all the other places in Israel, you know, um, <laughs> how um, even in some of the most holy places, there's a lot of uh, tension, right? But you go to this place and no, you don't, you don't feel it. And even some of the commentators will write this. Um, so anyway, the whole idea is that um, God spoke to Moses face to face on Mount Sinai, but now he comes to the multitudes himself and speaks to them with, with grace, okay? Um, so... Um, that's kind of like just the, the basic introduction of, of the, the Sermon on the Mount. And like we were saying, the first parts are, are the, the Beatitudes. The blessed are those, you know, for they shall, you know, receive this, right? <clears throat> the way that leads to the joy and blessing and happiness, because um, the word makarios is different than, um, uh, like we say, blessed, right? But it's, it's a lot more than that. I think we, we talked about this in a sermon a couple months ago, um, but the word itself is, is f rich of, with meaning, not just of having a blessing, but also being joyful um, and, and filled in the spirit, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so um, we don't have time to go through each one of these um, uh, because every phrase or every sentence of the Lord can be a sermon in and of itself. Um, and... The, I guess the thing that I want to end with is that <clears throat> the church kind of teaches us that this is not just information that we learn, but um, the more we read it and the more we memorize it, which I think is why we put it every hour, um, sorry, every day in, in the church um, book of hours, um, is that we can begin to, to memorize it and think about it deeply and the, the grace of God in the scriptures is not just given to us, like Abuna was saying today, um, as a mental exercise, but the purpose is for us to have our life changed and transformed, right? And so the fathers teach us that the reading of scripture and the recitation of scripture in and of itself can give us the power to follow the, the, the guidelines. It's not just do this, don't do that, but God is saying, I will give you the power. Just look in, in the scripture, learn, and be filled with it, 
and then I will give you the grace to accomplish it. Um, and I think that's why um, a lot of the, the fathers <coughs> will recommend, okay, read the three, three, you have an issue, read the three chapters, um, and then come back to me. Um, and probably you won't have to come back because you will have your, your answer um, uh, or your problem solved, or you will have, be filled with the grace that God gives you to, to accomplish whatever is needed. Um, so if I want to be a strong Christian with a strong faith, just like the disciples and the martyrs, then I have to be his disciple, right? Um, <clears throat> so one last thing, like um, the Sermon on the Plain with St. Luke in chapter 6, um, he, he actually said, um, instead of sitting on a mountain, it says Christ came to them on a level place. Um, so some people say, oh, that's a contradiction. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, the church fathers and, and um, the Bible is complementary. Um, but like I was saying, even geographically, there is a plain on top of the mountain, um, what, which, which gave the opportunity to build all those nice things. Right? Um, the other thing was that the Lord comes to us, um, and uh, so here he's standing. And St. Luke is saying that he's standing. Um, but, but the idea is like he's giving the message not just to the disciples, but to all nations. And that's the theme of St. Luke. Because St. Matthew wrote to the, to the Jews and he wanted to con convince the Jews, okay, uh, God uh, selected you for a time to be his special people. Um, continue in, in following Christ. But St. Luke wanted to say, no, no, God came and Christ came for all. Um, and so that, that's why he emphasized the fact that he came and spoke on a level place. Um, he wants everyone to become his disciples, not just the 12 or the 70. Um, and so our goal is to follow in the footsteps of the disciples and the martyrs um, and to endure the temptation and to go to the cross and to witness the ascension. All, all the same things that the disciples went through um, physically, we want to taste spiritually. Um, and so the first part of living it is learning it. And so that's why we want to be as familiar we can, as we can with these three chapters. And I'm sure um, a lot of you, when you read, it will bring back memories of maybe when you learned this for the first time in Sunday school, or um, a lot of the things that we sometimes take for granted in our daily life. Uh, like this is, we say, oh no, this is just knowledge, but my life is different. Because the calling is very high. It's a very high standard that sometimes we might read and say, oh, that's not practical. Yeah, for the worldly person and the person who deals with everything on a worldly basis, it's not practical, but this is the way. Like, this is, this is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and even if we follow this out of obedience, then God will give us the grace. Um, so I guess that's what um, all we wanted to uh, talk about today. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Comments? I, I, I need. If you need to, Lord, pray. It's chapter six. <laughs> um, prayer and fasting and giving the chapter six. <laughs> and even has our Father prayer in it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Glory be to Him. Now I'm turning to the HR. Stand to pray. I, the Lord, through the intercession of all the choir of the heavenly saints, hear, and have, hear us and have mercy upon us and make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten. Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, union and gift, fellowship, the Holy Spirit be with you. Depart in peace, and the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you for your time.